Welcome everyone to Coaching This Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about what I love, mindset. And we're going to be having a guest, Anna O'Connor, who's going to be helping us with our mindset, the work she does, and then having a unique and interesting and open conversation today. Because today's episode is going to be near and dear to my heart and is going to be near and dear to most people's minds because there's something the mind wants and something the mind craves. Do you know what that is? Well, let's find out together. Welcome, Anna O'Connor, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so glad to have you on, and I'm happy that we're able to meet because I know we have some scheduling issues, and that's my end, right? Because my life is just getting more hectic and more crazy by the minute. But I'm so glad to have you here because you are a mindset and performance coach. One of the things you work on is you help people do more and stress less. When you're so busy like myself, stress can be so rampant, so quick to come. I want to kind of talk about the work you do and how you help people. So in your own words, can you tell the world what you do and how you help? Sure. Again, I'm excited to be here and I totally get getting really busy. And with the good stuff comes some added stress because you got more you're juggling. So it makes total sense. I work with mostly athletes, teams, and I do work with some organizations where I teach them how to stop the mental blocks that keep coming up and keeping them from doing what they really want to do. And I teach them how to create empowering habits. And when I say empowering habits, I mean thought habits, emotional habits, so that they can do what they really are put on earth to do and do it the very best they can. And when you start to work with these teams, these athletic teams, what's like the before and after? If you had to kind of give like night and day type of transformation before you start working with them and then after you have worked with them. Most of the people that I work with come to me and they're having confidence issues. They're fighting themselves. They feel like they're not good enough or they're underperforming. And almost all of them come in with these things that they tell themselves. And I'm sure you've heard of that being a mindset coach. And I approach everything through the brain. I did emotional brain training and created my own coaching process around the brain. So that when they come to me, I can ask questions and drill down to where this habit that they have of believing about themselves started or close to it. And then we can address it, recover from it and create the new and true thought belief that they are really going to thrive under and achieve what they set out to do. So they go from being confused and overwhelmed to clear confident, and ready to take on what comes their way. And that's the goal. I talk about finding the root cause of problems quite often on the podcast, sometimes with guests, sometimes without guests. And I always tell people, find out where you are. And a lot of people, they would rather be someplace different, right? They want to be a different person. It's easy to dream to be someone else. I remember when I was in high school, I would always look at the people who were good at something, right? If you're good at basketball, Oh, I wanted to be him. I like, like I wanted to be good like him. Or if they're good at a subject, I want to be him. I want to be her, right? I want to be smart like that. But when I had all the capabilities within myself to do that, it's just that I would have to give myself that push. I would have to give myself that confidence and then give myself that goal. And oftentimes what people do is we give ourselves a fantasy, but the fantasy is only an idea, but there's no action. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going to be coming to you who have these fantasies of who they want to be, the dreams of who they know they can be, but they just don't necessarily know how to get there. What are maybe some of the first steps that you help guide people to really looking at their fantasy, making it become a reality? Great question. I, I love how you put that. They have a fantasy. The first part of it is finding out where they are, meeting them where they are. And like a lot of people will, you know, right now I have a freshman program that I'm working with freshmen because it's such a huge transition. You know, they're coming from being a superstar in the high school level. And now they're at a D1 school where nobody knows their name (laughs) and they're just another person 
and there's people way better than them. They're not used to that and they kind of lose their identity. The first thing I like to do is kind of normalize where they are. Of course, they feel that way. They've never been in the situation. They're usually the kid that demonstrates everything. And now they don't even know where their locker is in the locker room. And so normalizing kind of dials back their panic. The next step would be asking great questions as far as, you know, this, what are you envisioning? And when they share, you know, I wanted to be, you know, carried off the field, you know, win in the championship. Then I just bring them back to reality. Really? I think of Kobe Bryant, you know, everybody's like, I want to be like Kobe. You know, people didn't think about, he took a thousand shots after practice, a thousand every day. Most people are not willing to do that. And that is the separation. You know, that is where, you know, you're only going to be as good as you're willing to take number of shots, right? You know, then bringing them back to reality of like, okay, yeah, you know, that guy, he's been here four years. He uh, stays 30 minutes after every practice and shoots at least 100 balls, you know, just pointing these things out that it kind of brings it into reality. And then they can form and create their own plan of attack on how they want to accomplish their fantasy. And it might bring it back into a little more reality where they're not quite getting carried off the field, but they're part of the team that, you know, wins a national championship or something like that. And the identity is that top part that we get. It's the final part of our stages of development. So we finally create ourselves. Typically, we create ourselves in high school. It's kind of like our pretty solid one. We create one in elementary school also, but in high school, it's a little bit more firm. And the reason I say firm is because now we attach emotions to it. We have our hormones going. We are very emotional. And now we have an ego on top of it that is now our identity. So it's difficult for especially teenagers going off from the high school level to the college level, being that top dog to now being a freshman again, and everyone's better, everyone's bigger, everyone's stronger. And you're just like, I thought I was good, right? So the identity that they have created is almost shattered. It's overnight too. It's just like, I thought I was good. I thought I was the best. I thought I was doing everything I could. And then the identity is like, yeah, not really, right? So it's kind of like that taste of defeat. And, you know, I always explain it like the only way to grow resilience in yourself is to get knocked down and go through tough times. And if you've been one of the best, if not the best in your area, you know, they play club and all that, you haven't had to be super resilient. And nobody signs up to be, you know, nobody says, yeah, I want to get knocked out, you know, so I have to climb my way back in, you know. So life has to hand you the opportunities to grow resilience and you got to grab them and not see them as not become a victim to them more as, okay, this is a challenge and I'm up for it. You've got to, you know, it's the mindset. And if they haven't ever had to do it, a lot of times they'll just crumble because they don't know what it is. And it's not that they're not good enough. They just haven't had to be resilient. You know, it happens in, you know, adults and professions when you go to a new company and you're the hot dog at the other one and you go to this new one or, you know, people do it with their kids, which is kind of sad. But in the sports world, it happens a lot. Putting your identity all in one thing that is fleeting is dangerous. That reminds me of a story. It's was kind of the story that kind of began my whole mindset journey was the story of Dan Millman. He's a, an Olympic gold medalist who was in a motorcycle accident and he fractured his leg. And it just wasn't just a small fracture. He shattered his femur, right? So he was put together with pins and needles and metal, right? So he was basically a man that was brought back to life, right? The doctor said that he would maybe be able to walk again with the use of a cane. They said that he would never be in the Olympics and to stop that dream. And that was all he had. That was all he thought about. That was what he wanted. That was his goal. That was his dream. And when the doctor told him that he couldn't have that anymore, he lost his identity. He lost his self. And the book, The Peaceful Warrior, is also a movie. It was about that journey of him learning about himself, learning about the identity, losing his identity, and then finding it again, and then being resilient similar to what you were saying, we have those problems. We are going to get roadblocks in our life. 
there's going to be some hiccup that's going to happen. You're going to look at the problem. You're going to look at the scenario, the situation, and your brain is going to be saying, turn around, start over, do something different. Don't go head first. That's crazy talk. Do something different. And oftentimes, many people are right at that tip to getting over their obstacles, getting out of their comfort zone, but they fall back down. That's where many people kind of fall into mediocrity. And I always say that if you find mediocrity, try to lose it very quickly because that's going to be very difficult to get out of. And even for me, when I was a teacher, I was a teacher for several years before I became a coach. I noticed just after my first three years of teaching how I was falling into that realm of just, all right, it's another Monday. Oh, it's the weekend. Oh, it's another school year. And it happened so quick. And I didn't even realize it until I was in it. Because when I was in college, I worked a full-time and a part-time job, 60 plus hours a week, went to school, 18 credits, graduated, honors. I did all of that. But then the moment I go into school and I'm thinking, or work basically career, I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to do it anymore, right? I have my job. I did exactly what I was supposed to do. So I was going to work. I had all this free time. Guess what I did in my free time instead of work, instead of read and develop myself? I just went home and watched movies. So I noticed that I wasn't pushing myself anymore. And it was because I kind of fell down into that mediocrity level where, oh, day-to-day stuff. And I think a lot of people do that. And then that becomes a new identity. So they might have been this courageous person in college and, oh, I'm a go-getter. But then they finally get into that career, maybe family man. Now they fall into their identity. I wanted to talk to you about switching identities. How easy is it for an identity shift to happen in oneself if there is a trauma or if there is no trauma? I think that the identity thing, one of the things I always tell or ask on athletes that I talk to, because getting injured, you know, it happens a lot and it can take you out forever or for a season. So they need to be prepared in some way to be multidimensional. I say, you know, you're not just an athlete. You're not just this sports person. What else are you? And one client right now has an injured back and working with him, I said, you know, you still love the sport. You're just going to have to find a different way to put yourself in it. And now he's, you know, working as kind of like an assistant coach, kind of a volunteer coach. And he's like helping the team. And so he's still being able to be a part of the team. And I think that's a huge part. They can maybe not play, but not being a part of the team is super hard. With the identity thing is it's coming to, you know, coming to Jesus with yourself and saying, what am I really made of? And it makes you go where you never probably wanted to go or thought there was a place to go. And that's not always a bad thing. It tests you and you can choose to use tools to get where you need to go. And then to see that you have so much more to do. There's so many more avenues. I mean, we could have been so many different things. I have so many passions, right? I have so many things I love to do. Having that is always better. I always warn parents, don't make them specialize in a sport. You know, at the age of 10, that's crazy. Let them play everything, you know, until they are like, I have got to only play this. And they need to be around 14 before they can even say that. This world gets really hyper-focused on being in the spotlight, getting recognition on social media and the accolades and the it's a culture of comparison. And, and with sports, it always is. I mean, you're always fighting for a position, fighting to win, and you're always comparing. It's tough. It's great for life lessons because, you know, the world is tough out here. And I often tell parents, if they're going to struggle with all this kind of stuff, let them do it under your roof where they have a safe place to come. And then in college, you know, my goal is like they have an athletic trainer to help all the athletes with their physical strains and pains. I believe there should be a mental health trainer available to all the athletes, all the sports to help them with their mental and emotional strains and pains so that it's right there and easy to access because they need it. And I know many NFL teams are starting to transition into that too, where they're getting uh, some type of a leader that's going to help them, not like a coach, but help them with their mind, that battle with their mind. 
And I forget who said it, but like the battle begins in the mind. And it's it's, it's a famous quote from, from someone. When we understand that our mind can be the enemy sometimes, it makes us a little bit more aware because we have those negative self-talks or those limiting beliefs that we give ourselves. And it could be unconscious where it's just like, we don't know that we're doing it. Maybe from childhood or from school, we develop that or from our friends, things like that. All of those can have an effect on that mindset where we might be confident, but then there's something inside of us saying, the only reason I am confident is because I'm number one. And the moment I'm not number one anymore, I'm not confident. So it's like they lose who they are because of their mindset. And mindset is so interesting to me because one path, again, going to the different paths that we can have in our life doesn't necessarily mean you're going to turn out this way. If I had someone walk exactly in my path, did exactly what I did, saw what I saw, I can almost guarantee you that they wouldn't have the outcome that I had. And the reason is, is because of perception, how they perceive things. And if you have a scenario, you can see a scenario as good. You can see a scenario as bad. That's why mindset is so interesting. You have to kind of know how people are kind of thinking or how they're wired in their brain, because if they're wired to think a certain way, oh, I know how you're wired. And then we can adjust it if it's not conducive to helping them reach your goals, if they have a negative mindset, very pessimistic. If they don't really want to do much in life, then they're probably safe to stay that way. But if they have ambitious goals and they're trying to get something out of their life and trying to get every bit out of their day, they're going to have to ramp up their mindset. They're going to have to be positive. They're going to have to be a go-getter. They're going to have to be hungry in the sense of, I'm going to do what it takes. But then again, they say they'll do everything it takes, but it doesn't mean that they do it. And I remember I was working with a young man. He was 16. And he said he wanted to be one of the world's best soccer players. I said, okay, that's not a problem. Like, that's an easy task, I told him. I said, okay, well, tell me your favorite player. He said, okay, this is my favorite player. I I forget the name of the player. So I said, okay, what's his practice regimen? So he Googled it and everything. He told me, I said, triple it, triple it every single time. So if this is his training regimen for a week, you condense that week into whatever it is, but you triple that. So you were doing three times to work, right? Doing three times to work. And he was like, okay. The first week, he didn't even do one week's of work of the person. So I asked him, I said, I thought you wanted to be the best. And he's like, I do, but it's hard. I was like, well, life's not easy. It started to get worse, right? He started to go down. He basically found an escape plan. Okay, I can't be the best anymore because it's too much work, but I know what I'm good at. I'm good at running a business. So he just switched what he wanted to do. So he gave up. That was a very interesting mindset to have. You want to be the best, but you're not willing to put in the work. And then if I give you the assignment to do triple the work, if you really wanted to, and it wasn't going to be a long-term thing, I wanted him to understand if you can triple the work ethic in one week, then you're going to change your mindset overall. And I think sometimes people think that, oh, I have to kind of keep this up. Kobe Bryant, he would train what, three or four times a day. But then, of course, there was times when, depending on the season, off season, he would not train that much, right? He might train two times a day. So there was time to rest and there was time to push. When it's time to push, it's kind of like in the beginning. Push yourself, train your brain to understand how powerful it is. And then from there, that's the foundation for you to build your dreams and to build your life upon. And, you know, I I love that example. It's funny. What I'm coming up with is that young man, what about being the best that he want? What about it? Money. You know, if it was for attention and to live that I'm the best life, that's not going to sustain you through all that work. It's got to be like, you can't not do it. Like, probably like I will coach forever. I'll never stop working because I love it. It's what I do. It's what my purpose I don't need but so much motivation. Motivation doesn't last. You know, you've got to be able to have that desire, that passion that keeps burning when it's hard, because even if it is your passion, there's hard stuff about it that you don't really like, <laughs> like all the back end stuff. You know, I think that's one thing like people forget that it's got to be more than just the external accolades and the external shiny objects and attention. Or it will be fleeting. I mean, you'll win the World Series and you won't feel like you accomplished it. 
You know, some people go through all the hard work and get to, you know, their goal and then they're empty. And because they put their identity in the working and the I'm this. And then once I get that, I'm going to be happy. But you're still the same person. You've got to make it about your passion, your purpose. And it's bigger than you. Yeah. And that young man, his goal was money. He wanted to have a lot of money. And the thing about money is that it comes and it goes. Your passion doesn't necessarily go that quickly. Your purpose stays with you for as long as it can. Passions, are, again, are quick. For example, in high school, I, what did I do? I played volleyball in high school. I mean, I like volleyball, but it didn't mean I wanted to take it up in college. But in college, I did music. So in college, I did music, guitar, all that stuff. A lot of fun. It's, it's my passion, music. But today, it's not necessarily, oh, I have to play guitar. Oh, I have to teach music. Oh, that, right? That passion was there. When I talked to one of my mentors who helped me understand my purpose, I thought it was music. That was my passion. I thought it was maybe some sports that I enjoyed. That was my passion, right? Things I liked. I was good at math, accounting, finance. I could start a career in that, be successful. My passion. But what's my purpose, right? And he talked to me and he said, your passion or your purpose is teaching. And he said, the reason I can tell is because every time we talk about it, you light up, you change a different color. From there, it's like I knew what I wanted to do. Didn't matter what type of teaching it was. Coaching is teaching. I'm teaching people how to get to a better mindset, get to a better life. It's a process for them. You have to have that type of analytical mind, that type of engineer mind where you're looking at everything. And one of my big strengths is cause and effect, where if we do something, there's going to be an effect on it. Sometimes people don't realize that their actions have consequences for the good or for the worse. So if you're working out and you're doing everything you have to do, having a healthy diet, well, the effect is going to be you're going to look amazing. You're going to be strong. But if in the same turn, you're not taking care of yourself and you're hanging around toxic people and you're eating bad food, you're going to feel bad too. You're going to feel lethargic. You're going to be unhappy and you're going to wonder why. And the reason why is because the actions that you were taking weren't in line with what you truly wanted. It was just the actions that you kind of did. And I think a lot of people, they fall into the subconscious way of thinking where they just follow society, follow a schedule or routine, right? Because it's easy to go to work to a nine to five, come home, sit on the sofa, do it again for the rest of your life until you're 65, you retire at 65, and then 10 years later, you die because that's what statistics say. At 65, you have about 10 years left because now the body is learning, oh, wait, I don't have a purpose anymore. I don't have a will to wake up. We have to have that urge or that driver force. And I think a lot of people are missing that. How do you help people uncover that drive, that passion? Because it could be different for different people, right? Because someone's going to have a different passion, of course. But how do you help people unlock it? How do you help people find it? I think it goes down to asking great questions and drilling down to what really matters to them. We'll just use the young man we've been talking about. And now he's wanting to make a lot of money. I have a brother who was like that too. And he had many passions, but he always wanted to make a lot of money. And he has, but you would never know it. You would have no idea that he's worth a lot of money because it wasn't about the final number. It was about him stretching himself, being creative, finding a way to create a company that could do great things. And it was all about creating in a way that could prosper him and others. And he did. He's an engineer too. And so I think it has to be about not the shiny object at the end. You know, our shiny object at the end would be, you know, seeing someone transform, that their life changes. And, you know, for me, it's the connection I have with these people. I mean, I love the relationships. That's my drug. You know, I love connecting with people. And of course, I love seeing them heal and improve and reach their dreams, of course. But it's the connection. It's the relationships that are my driver. When it comes to working with young people or anyone, to be honest, when it comes to mindset, this is one of those things where it lights me up because I understand that I'm helping them uncover something that they might have not been able to do alone 
or if they would be able to do it, it would take them a little bit more time because they are trying to figure out, okay, what's what? It's a lot of trial and error when you don't have a coach. I'm a testament to that. I had so much trial and error because I didn't have anyone guiding me. I was the first in my family to go to college. I was trying to figure that out. And then, of course, after the fact, okay, well, what do I do now? Right. Because there was no one else who had graduated college like this and then going off to be a teacher and then trying to figure out, all right, how do I move? And it's very difficult because you have many avenues to go down and you just have to kind of test the waters a little bit. But I know now if I had a coach guiding me, listening to me, my thoughts, my feelings, my actions, looking at that whole picture, they can guide me a lot better. Not saying that I'm not appreciative to my journey because it made me who I am. All those hardships and all those failures I had. Helps to make you a good coach. (laughs) It makes me a good coach. And I remember I was talking to another coach and they said, this is why you're probably a coach because you had all these failures and now you're trying to mitigate those failures in other people's lives, which I was like, that's rightfully so. Probably that is one of the drivers that I have is like, there are so many mistakes that I made let me not have you make those same mistakes. And it's the idea of wisdom. I want to talk to you about wisdom because wisdom is unique to every individual. Now, wisdom is going to be your embodied wisdom, or it can be wisdom passed upon you from a parent, loved one, friend, mentor, whoever, right? But when someone explains wisdom, I noticed over my years, it's always unique. It could be a personal story. It could be just mindset overall. It could be a method. But wisdom has a unique way of changing the mind. What I want from you, Anna, is to kind of lecture us on wisdom, the power of it. I love this question. I know. I want you to lecture us on wisdom, the power of it, what's behind it, how can it help us, things to be cautious of, everything you know about wisdom, and take it from there. Wisdom is infinite. I believe that wisdom is always collecting and staying curious and open. Wisdom is based on everything you consume, everything that you purge, (laughs) and the experiences of your life and the walks that you take with other people and the knowledge and the pain and suffering and joy that you experience for yourself and with others. Wisdom comes from a grounded place, a very grounded place, I believe. And I think it's infinite. I think it's something that we're always working on. And I think if you're fortunate enough to have, I call them godparents, those are extra parents that you get along the way to help you become the person you are. And, you know, I had four godmothers and two godfathers, and each one of those people just you know, there are nuggets that they shared that I took from them and they passed on. And I believe like you, you know, we go through the stuff that we go through and the goal is to learn from it and then pass it on. That's why we go through tough things so we can help the next person. And that's wisdom. We don't have all the answers, but I can give you some wisdom around it because I've seen the different dimensions of it, experienced it. I think wisdom's humble too, very humble, because it knows not to get too cocky, right? That's kind of where I'm coming from with wisdom. And I love that question. That's great. Yeah, we are going to dive deep into wisdom because I don't, because you're not done yet, because I know you have more to give. Wisdom for me is me listening to my father lecture me for an hour, two, three hours a night sometimes. And he would just tell us about life because we grew up poor. We grew up in the hood and gang violence, drugs, all that stuff, right? Bad place. I had the option to go down that path, right? To be a gangbanger too. Why did I not become a gangbanger? And I will say the reason why I didn't become a gangbanger is because of loving family members. I had great grandparents, great parent figures, and they always shared wisdom with me. They always spoke to me. Guess what doesn't happen today? We don't speak to our children. We are behind our smartphones. So that wisdom is not happening anymore. And these children are hungry for wisdom. They're only getting knowledge and they're only getting trial and experience wisdom or they're learning from their friends who don't know anything. So now it's a world of people that follow and not lead. Mm -hmm. I love that. 
And I think you were so spot on with your dad spending that energy and time face to face, because I think if we learn something from COVID is that the virtual, the texting, the emails, that is nothing replaces real connection, real connection where you can reach out and touch somebody and feel their energy and their passion or their sadness. And you are absolutely right. I completely agree with you. People are emotionally lazy because it does take extra energy to put out emotion and to share it, maybe even be vulnerable. And I think most people resist it. I mean, your brain's going to resist anything uncomfortable anyway. Our world is so comfy cozy that being uncomfortable is a millisecond and we change it. So learning to look for opportunities to sit, feel the squirm and discomfort and let it pass is a huge gift you can give yourself and the people around you because you become a lot less reactive and a lot more in tune to yourself and others. If you can sit in your own discomfort and self-regulate, really. These kids today are missing the human connection, the face-to-face, I love you. I care about you. I worry about you. I want everything to be okay for you. One of the best things my mom ever told me was, Anna, not everybody's going to like you. Parents would never say that now. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yes, you say it because you love them. You say it. Because not everybody is. And it was one of the best things she ever told me because it allowed me to just be me. I didn't try to be anybody else. You know, that is um, freeing, very freeing. And I love your story. I'm a fascinated by your story. And uh, I was going to ask you, I have many questions. We've got to talk again because I'd love to hear your whole story. And because I am fascinated by the one that gets out. I would say, again, it kind of goes back to something I hinted at at the beginning, because I always leave hints, uh, breadcrumbs, if you will, in my episodes, you don't have to find them, but they're there. And I typically won't air an episode if there's no breadcrumbs, FYI. Episodes that are aired on the podcast have breadcrumbs in them that lead you to a certain way of thinking, mindset, right? The whole idea of coaching a session is touching base with Reven concepts, turning never around, turning or limiting beliefs around, turning your mindset into what you want it to be. Now, how you perceive it is very close to Napoleon's Hill. If you can perceive it and you can believe it, then you can achieve it, right? Mm -hmm. When you are in a situation like that, right, and you have a lot of negativity around you, you have to look at the stages of development, right? Typically, we learn from our environment. It's one of our big ones, right? Children, toddlers, that's that's how they learn primarily. They look at parents, they look at the people around them, and they mimic it. So after some time, they start to regulate and they figure out, okay, these are my values and my beliefs. And then eventually somewhere down the line, they create their identity. But in the meantime, the environment is so important because they can see someone getting shot on the corner and they can say, well, I guess I, ha- I better be the shooter. Or they could say, I better stay inside. But there's also another person that they can be. Okay, well, I don't want to be either or, right? I want to be someone who's not in this scenario anymore. I want to be someplace where I feel safe. Where is that? I want to still be out and I want to be helping people. You have to look at the different avenues and there's so many paths that you possibly could take. There's not just one. So uh, so I can't give you one path for me, especially for me, because I had so many different options and I had so many different groups of friends and It's difficult for me to say, oh, I went down this path. This is how you should do it. My advice to anyone in that situation is to look at your environment, to look at your situation, take a step back, and then ask yourself, do you want to be there in 50 years? Just kind of throw a number out there. Will you want the same life 50 years from now? Most people, if they can look at it that way, then it's like, oh, I don't want to be 50 years old or 60 or 70 years old and living in this rundown house or having no food to eat in the fridge, that can change you, 
right? When you're in that type of living situation, you can either succumb to it or you can say, you know what? I'm going to grow into a lifestyle that doesn't have this there anymore. So my pantry is stocked. My fridge is stocked. I have a nice car. I have all of these wonderful things that maybe my parents didn't have. We did have, right? Like we were still well off. I'm not going to say that we were eating out of trash cans or anything. Like they took care of us. But my goal was to be better. Not saying that my parents were bad, just to elevate. And one of the things my dad often tells me, he says that he wanted us to be better than him, right? So better than his situation, better than his parenting. I mean, you name it, he always wanted to elevate us to the next level. And what he did was a self-sacrifice, basically, where he sacrificed his body, his mind, his manlyhood for the sake of his children. But what that did was it took away that generational curse type of thing, I guess you can say where it's like, we can continue to do this generation after generation until someone steps up. Fortunately for me, he stepped up. So it was easy for me to say, I can step up too. Versus if he was setting the bar down here, I had the option to set the bar down here too. This was the bar for me. So it's like, yeah, parents that give you that option, it's like, okay, well, we're expecting this, but he never even told me he was expecting that. Well, you know, I think the thing that you, a couple of things that you said that were just really good was, you know, you didn't have one pack, but you had options. And I believe that a lot of people don't think they have options. Like you said, they think they need to be the shooter or stay inside. You saw the world bigger. You know, your dad, what an amazing person. He showed you that there were many choices, which is such a gift, you know, that then you could be really creative and find out what you can do. The other thing that I love is monetarily y'all had enough, but he showered you with all the the stuff that really mattered, wisdom, love, care, nurturing, attention. And so often today, oh my gosh, they are getting all the stuff, but no attention. Oh my gosh, it breaks your heart. I mean, I think that women who have these amazing jobs. I mean, huge jobs. They're double income family and they work full time and the dad works full time, big jobs. And they drive amazing cars, go on amazing vacations, have an amazing house. They just can't wait for the weekend to get away from their kids. And the kids are hungry for their parents, not just attention. They want their parents' attention. And it's a lot you know, for whatever the reasons are. I mean, we can talk about that, but I think that was the secret. Your dad gave you the right gifts and letting you know that there were options. He's a wise man. And that's why I love wisdom so much is because of him. Knowledge is one thing, right? You can read a lot of books and be book smart, but when you're wise, you're street smart. So if I ever go back to my home city, right, where I was born and raised, I think the city cleaned up a little bit. So we're not like the 16th most dangerous city in America anymore. So I think we're doing better. Where is that? Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport, Connecticut was a hub back in, I think it was like the World War II time around there. They've made a lot of ammo. This is where GE was. So General Electric, it was a big city where a lot of people would go there. And when everything moved out, they stopped making ammo there. GE moved out. The city kind of went under too. I think Sayers had a big mall there and then Sayers went under. So it's kind of like, I'm dating myself, I guess. But all of that was happening. And then when it all went away, the city kind of died. And it happened in multiple cities in Connecticut because we grew so quickly, but it couldn't be sustained. And then when everything collapsed, it was just like, okay, well, what's left, right? And then everyone was basically scrounging for scraps. And that was the life, right? Where people made the best of what they had. Not saying that if you grew up in that place or if you grew up in Chicago or Detroit, things like that, you should look at your situation as bleak and meager and that you can't get out. You should be able to get out. You just have to understand your situation, understanding where you are. Going back to what we talked about in the beginning of the episode, figure out what you want. Looking at your obstacles, what are they? Now, of course, if maybe you have a basic need, right? We need sleep, we need water, we need food, we need shelter, we need love and affection. 
if those basic needs are not being met, we either are going to be without or we're going to look for it in some way, whether it be negative or positive. So that child who's not getting love and affection from the parent, why not act out? Because they're going to get the love and affection somehow. And it might not be love. It might be like discipline, but to them, it's still attention. And kids who are seeking that attention, again, they're yelling for their parents to say, hey, just talk to me. Just, you know, be traditional once more. And going to what you said just briefly, we live in a very modern society. Both people want to go work. Both people want to go on vacations. Both people don't want to have responsibilities. People are so quick to toss their responsibilities to someone else. But if you have a traditional type of mindset, which is what I prefer, I'm not over here saying, you know, my clients all have to be traditional to work with me, but I need to know before we begin, hey, you know, what type of mindset do you have? And I typically just ask a few questions. Do you have a traditional mindset or do you have a modern mindset? Because it's different how I have to approach the questions. Because if you have a traditional type of mindset, it's a lot easier. I could be very blunt versus modern. Modern, I have to be like, all right, let's go very slow, right? Let's figure out what we need. I'm here to help you. Got any questions? Ask me, right? Versus this is your problem. We need to fix this right now. You know, I always think about in the moment, it is hard. I mean, to raise kids and I stayed home with the kids, but I'll tell you, we didn't do a lot to our house. We didn't have amazing cars. We didn't go on big vacations. We stayed home a lot, you know, and I don't regret one second and neither do my kids. I also see where young women today have so many more options than I ever did. I was a teacher too, by the way, and I didn't have all those options. And I do believe if they have, you know, a passion for, you know, being, you know, a radiologist or, you know, managing, you know, a marketing company or whatever, they can do that. They just have to be really conscious and be on top of connecting, you know, truly connecting with their kids every day and not making it. Yeah, honey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, that's not connecting and they, they feel it. And I think they're lonely. It's interesting because a lot of people, they associate work with being busy where, oh, if I work a full-time job, I don't have time for anything else. My mom, she worked two to three jobs, I, I believe, to put us through private school. And I think that was kind of one of the paths that I was on. Because if I went to public schools, the probability of me going down that, I guess you could say that city life that I was living or just in, would have been more difficult for me to not see, right? So in a sense, I was sheltered, right? Going to Catholic schools and being in that environment. So she sacrificed And the only time I really saw her, to be honest, was when she was sleeping because she was working all all the time. And sometimes, you know, she would, you know, be up or we should have a day off, you know, once in the blue. And the same with my dad, you know, he wanted to be a bad boy in the beginning. He wanted to go out, live his life, be with his friends. But as they matured, right, because they had us, I believe, first one was 18 and then the second one was like 20, 21. So, so they had us at a very young age in the sense of maturity, right? So they weren't quite there yet. So they were still trying to live their best life. And I think what's happening right now, especially with women, is that they're trying to live their life and they're doing all these wonderful things, right? Going, getting a career, going, traveling, all that stuff. And they're starting a family a little bit later on. But when they do that, I also find that they have a difficult time letting go of what they built. So it's like, I built this and I don't want to let it go. So then when they finally get their kids at 34, 35, 36, they get a nanny. You take care of my kid. I have to go make money. I have my kid. I have my family, but it's not there. But I will tell you what my mom did. I think about this quite often. I'm sure she's going to be touched. She won't even remember this. One day we were going to my great grandmother's house because she had to go to work. So she dropped us there. And we would stay there until either my dad came and got us when he got off work or my mom got off work at 11 o'clock at night and we would go home. And so I remember my brother had just finished mopping the kitchen. And I, I don't know how old I was. I was probably like in third or fourth grade. And so I was running as a kid does. And there's no wet mop signs in my house. So I was running not thinking. I slip. I fall. I you know bang my elbow or whatever I bang. 
start crying. And my mom takes some time and she, you know, brings me to the sofa and she just, you know, says it'll be okay. It's going to be okay. Right. This woman is literally about to be late for work, but she's spending that time with me saying it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Consoling me. Then I got up, went in the car, went on my day, rode bike later that night. I was fine. But today, how quick would a parent be? You'll be okay. Just get up or just, you know, do this, give them a band aid. All right. See you later. You know, here's some ice cream. Here's a PlayStation. Here's your iPad. Here's a smartphone, right? If something is wrong, they don't create that interpersonal experience anymore. Yeah. She chose you over going to work. Right. Exactly. But what does that do to mindset? Well, she nurtured you and made you and told you by doing that, that you matter and you deserve attention and love. I mean, that's what she did in that one moment, even though she was gone a lot. And I wrote down, you had your grandmother. That was your godmother your other, you know, female parent. And, you know, so you were given what you needed. And then when your mom had choices to make, she made them and it matters. And I mean, I can't say I was the perfect mom by any means. So I was not, I did try to choose them as much, you know, as much as I could, you know, being human. I'm sure I didn't sometimes when I should have, and I genuinely enjoyed them. You know, that's important too. I love having kids. Some people, I think, just have kids because they think it's the next thing I should do. And I I really admire people that choose not to. I really do. And I love kids. And But I can see, like, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were like, I can't believe she doesn't want to have kids. You know, that's so sad. What about him? I go, well, I'm sure they talked about it. But if she doesn't want to, she really shouldn't. It is the hardest job in the world. And it is the most selfless job. You could do everything right, and it's still not work out. You know, I mean, it's a hard, fulfilling, wonderful job. And I love what you said that, like, she chose me and that she gave me nurture, care, like along those lines. But if we don't do it, that means we don't feel loved or we don't feel acknowledged or chosen. So a lot of people are just walking through that. And trying to find it in all the wrong places. And what I named were the core wires, beliefs that all humans need. You need to know you matter. You need to know you're good enough. And you need to know that you're worthy and you deserve. And that's what she did. And that one, it probably was, what, five minutes, if? If that, yeah. If yeah. that. It's, yeah. It was so quick. And she probably did a lot of it, but that's the one you remember. Right. Yeah. But but we pay attention as kids and we see all the things that parents do. We see the things parents don't do. A lot of times, especially in today's day and age, parents are so busy. And I say that loosely because they're not busy. They're just preoccupied. They're procrastinating. They're doing all these different things. And I knew from the schools what was going to happen next, the cause and effect of the schools and seeing how they were developing. I already saw the parents like that back when I was teaching and when I was teaching 2009, just like 2009 to 2016. I saw that happening. Parents were already saying, I'm choosing something else besides my kids. And I saw the kids going through the process and how broken they were. But again, I, there's many reasons behind my business, but that's one of them because there's so many broken children or adults now because their parents didn't give them what they needed to be 100% by the time they were adults, by the time they graduated. And like the wires that I was saying, like I had two parents and my mom stayed home and my dad, you know, was breadwinner, was very traditional. And it was a chaotic, kind of crazy house. And the youngest is six. He was a horrible alcoholic. My mom was, you know, a doormat. Uh, Older siblings protected me a lot. However, you know, my, I was, I was invisible. I mean, I didn't matter. There's other siblings in my house that, you know, they would never be good enough. You don't deserve, you know, love even. So the experience growing up, it creates your deepest beliefs about yourself. What I try to do is help people see, okay, you don't have to remember the first time, but like one person, it was, you know, they did a a science experiment in the garage and the dad came out. They were so excited to show the dad and the dad flipped out because all his tools were mess. And so then that kid decides, you know what, I'm never going to be good enough. That is not what his dad was saying. His dad was just being him. And this young man happened to be the person that got it that day. It could have been somebody else. It just happened to be him. 
once they start realizing that it was more about the other person, it helps. And then they can see that, you know, I choose if I'm enough. I choose that. No one else can choose that for you because you have everything you need inside. You just need to know how to access it. That's probably the biggest thing that I do is help people with that because we all have that stuff. And it's just being able to know what to do and how to address it. And I want to say that, you know, I do see you and you are good enough. And I'm so happy that we were able to spend some time today and to really talk about mindset, to talk about wisdom, to talk about identity, just some of the brief things that is mindset and mindsets. I want people to understand is it's not just one episode because mindset has taken me almost 200 episodes and I have plenty more to give. There's still more to mindset than just, again, figuring out what you want to do in your life and then creating a plan. And you do need someone to help you, someone to guide you, whether it be a parent, a friend, a mentor, a coach, to make sure that you're in the best place possible for yourself today and tomorrow. And I know just speaking with Anna briefly today, I can tell what her mindset is and is exactly in tune to helping anyone who's going after more in their life reach it. So if I can from you, Anna, as a closing statement, please give us any final words and then please share how people can find you. First of all, thank you so much. I loved our conversation. It was so real and about really important things, I believe, and care about most, you know, so I really appreciate that. Final um, closing thing is for people to just slow down a little bit. I have a shirt that says, slow your roll. And I have to tell myself that because if we slow our roll down a little bit, it gives our mind a chance to catch up and then see things for what they really are because your emotions run rampant. And if you can be more conscious of that by slowing your roll, it really helps you dial back your reactions, your stress, your anxiety your projection of shame and blame and anger. And it's more if you can just turn the finger from pointing out to in here and just ask, what's my part in this? Because if you can ask, what's my part in it and own it, that's where your power is because that's what you can control and you can do it. I'd love to work with anyone who's trying to stop pointing the finger at life and start pointing it at themselves and take control. Best way to reach me, honestly, is either to email me at Anna at Anna O Coaching, or you can also find me on Instagram when they're the most, and it's at Anna O Coaching, and you can DM me there. That's probably the easiest way. And I'll put all that information in the description box below so people can easily find you. And I encourage everyone to reach out to Anna just from speaking with her today, even before we started recording. I said, this is going to be a good show. And sure enough, sure enough, I can read people's energies like it is my job. And sure enough, it is. And I know the job that you're going to do with all of your future clients and your current clients is going to be amazing. So I want to thank you so much, Anna, for coming on and spending a, a bit of your time with me today. Thank you. And keep going. You're wonderful. And I so enjoy your podcast. Of course, and I won't stop. All right, everyone, I would like to thank you for watching the episode with Anna O'Connor and myself. As you can see, it was a lengthy episode, but I really wanted to give you the whole bit of it because what we spoke about was so true and so honest. And oftentimes I think we miss that in life. We miss that ability to be honest and open with each other. But if we were honest and open with each other, then we wouldn't be afraid to be who we are, or who we were meant to be. Because I think oftentimes we follow what society says or what our parents say, and it's difficult for us to come to a conclusion on our own. Well, if we came to conclusions on our own, then we would be able to go after more in our life. Because now we're not worrying about what other people are thinking about us, or we're not waiting for someone else to do something so we can do something. There's no contingency in our life. And oftentimes we create those roadblocks for ourselves and we create that wall in our mind that we have to climb or we have to destroy one day. I find that many people, they have a difficult time with this, that mindset, that way of thinking that they are enough, that they are able to. And this is not the sense of feminism or modern or traditional. This is the human nature right now. Human nature right now is we want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. But by who? 
oftentimes we pick the wrong people. We're so quick to go on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I hope they like what I post. I want more likes. I want more followers. When in reality, you only need yourself, maybe your family. And even if you didn't have your family, you can always get a coach and they become your family. I can't tell you how many clients that they lost everything, house, kids, partner. Now they're confused. They're like, what's next, Michael? How do I change my life? I lost everything. And oftentimes I tell them, well, you're in the best place to build. You have nothing to worry about. What do you want to build? Tell me about it. How do you want your life to look? The rest of your life, how do you want it to look? We can make anything you want, but you have to say it. And then that's when their brain starts moving. Hmm, that's a great question. I haven't thought about that because they're so worried about what they lost and they haven't realized what they can gain. Sometimes that shedding of all those stresses and worries, it sets us free. And in our world, we have so many stresses, so many worries, so many negativities that we hold on to that we don't even need. That's why we watch drama TV. That's why we sit on the sofa. That's why we complain about work. That's why we love Fridays, but we hate Mondays. That's why we say we're going to do something on New Year's, but then we stop three months later. It's all mindset. And you really have to ask yourself, what type of mindset do I have? What type of mindset do I want? What type of mindset do I need to help me get to the life that I want? And what I do as a mindset coach is I help people with the quality of their thoughts. What are you doing? What are you thinking? And then how do you want to move? Because when you're in a room full of snakes, you need to know how to move. And the world is filled with them, lying in wait, waiting for you to make a move, take a step so they can bite. And it doesn't feel good. And you're scared. And you're trying to figure out what do you do? Do you keep pushing on and getting bit? Or do you say, I don't want to get bit again, and you stay in your spot, your comfort zone of safety and security, and you don't try, and you don't dare, and you don't define your life. I'm here to tell you that today you can make that change. And the conversation that Anna and I had was going to be a part of that change too, where we're offering you an opportunity to create whatever type of life you want. What type of identity do you want to follow or create? You choose for yourself. Sometimes it could take a bit of trial and error, but when you have a coach with that embodied wisdom who already went down that path, we can figure out, well, these are the most probable paths for you from listening to what you said, from understanding your mindset, because again, cause and effect is mindset. If you know what you want and you know the action of what you do, then the actions that we do are going to have similar results. So we're going to be right in the ballpark of exactly where you want to be. And we modify, we adjust to your personality and to where you really want to be. Maybe you want to be better than other people. Well, okay, well, we work on all of those aspects of mindset. And that's why I love mindset because the mind is so powerful, but yet many people don't even realize it. You don't realize how powerful you are. You don't realize your worth. What would happen if you said today, I'm going to find out my worth? Today, I'm going to reach out to a coach. It doesn't have to be me. It could be Anna. And you say, I am interested in finding out who I was destined to be. Can you help me? That's the start of your journey. It's the start of your whole entire life. They say we're born two times in this world. The first time is when we're out from our mother's womb. And the second time is when we find out what we were meant to do. And if you haven't figured out what you were meant to do, your purpose, your passion, your why, then today can be that day, that day that you realize that you're born again, that you know what you were meant to do, that you can make the changes, that you're powerful, that you're strong. There's no need to be empowered because you already have the power within you. You just have to be aware. And mindset is about creating that awareness and then understanding that you always had it within you. Your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions are for you to control, not anyone else. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coachingincession at gmail.com and I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone, take care.